a resounding statement for Brent Venables and the Oklahoma Sooners to be able to impose your will early, take the punch back from Texas, and then be able to find a way to get a victory in an epic Red River win against the Longhorns. Obviously, you've got the revenge from the 49 to nothing uh, loss last year for Brent Venables, but also a little bit of validation. And that is the word that has really been, uh, I think, on my mind the most since this noon kickoff has ended, is we doubted Oklahoma because of the fact that it had only beat up on bad teams and that when it faced any team of consequence, it didn't necessarily always have its highest gear. But I, I still think Texas is really, really good, and Oklahoma won that football game. I mean, Tom, we're, you live blog this for CBSSports.com. Yes. So how, how do you sit with this? Um, I, you know, we, we made a lot of jokes all year about Dylan Gabriel and how Jackson Arnold was, you know. Oh, going to take his job? Going to take his job. And we even talked about how, you know, they, they don't beat Texas without Jackson Arnold probably. I don't think they beat Texas with Jackson Arnold today because I think part of what that was was, I mean, first of all, Gabriel – had the fantastic game. He threw for 285 yards, had a career high 113. He's the first Oklahoma QB to throw for at least 200, rush for 100, and rush and throw for a touchdown in the same game since Jalen Hurts did it against Texas in 2019 in the Red River rivalry game. But I, I just think that in that situation late in the game, in a game that was as chaotic as this one, even if Jackson Arnold is the more talented of the two, having somebody with the kind of experience that Dylan Gabriel has to just kind of stay calm and mm. not panic amidst all that craziness, I think turned out to be the difference in this one. Like the fact that they, after, after they gave up the lead in the final, like with a minute 15 left or whatever it was, and then they just kind of march right back downfield and get the, you know, the, the touchdown to go ahead and win the game instead of just settling for the field goal, I thought was a huge moment. And I think that for Oklahoma, I mean, that's, I wrote in the in the live blog afterwards. I said, I mean, it's not, it's not saying a whole ton because he lived in there for a season and a half. But it's like that's Brent Venables' signature win so far. That is yeah. the biggest win yeah. Oklahoma has had in the Venables tenure, and it's kind of a statement win for the Sooners. In that now you look like you look at the rest of their schedule. Who's beating them before they get to the Big Twelve Championship at this point? Like we, obviously, we just saw Miami lose to Georgia Tech. We we've seen a lot of crazy stuff today, so they can lose a game. It's just when you look at it. They're the clear-cut favorite to win that league or at least get to the title game, probably be undefeated. They're going to be in the playoff race. These are all things that were firmly established today with this win over Texas. And then on the other side, the thing I talked about on Wednesday when we did the big game breakdown was how Texas has struggled in the red zone all year. They were ranked 108th nationally coming into the game in red zone touchdown rate. Today, Texas had three red zone possessions. They got three points, including a goal line stand where they got stuffed because they brought in a bunch of 300-pound defensive linemen to use them as blockers, and they still couldn't get any blocks done, and dudes were still blowing up plays in the backfield. Oklahoma had six red zone possessions, scored on all six, got 34 points. Kind of a, you know, so they were outscored 31 points in the red zone in a four-point game in which they also lost the turnover battle three to nothing. Oklahoma won the game, and Texas lost it. So it's... I do think we're going to end up seeing these two playing again in the Big 12 title game. I think Tom nailed it about the red zone stuff. I mean, to, to me, that was the the number one sort of deciding factor on the day. But I, I thought Gabriel's legs were another one. It, it looked like Texas was really not expecting him to run or at least not run as effectively as he did. I, I mean, he had to be their leading rusher on the day, right? I, I, I would – hold on, I'll, I'll, I'll click over. I mean, a buck, 13, was, yeah. buck 13 mm -hmm. on the ground. Yep. Uh, which is you know really really impressive. I I thought Oklahoma blocked Texas fairly well. Like that's a good defensive front for Texas. You know to only allow five tackles for loss and only one sack. You know, credit Gabriel for moving around really deftly in the pocket. I, I I thought to find the open guy. They neither team hit a whole lot of like huge explosives. You know like, like you would kind of think with that kind of final score. But I thought Gabriel did a nice job of taking uh, what was available for him. It, it felt. 
like almost less schemed up for Gabriel than it was for for Quinn Ewers. Um, you know, with, with obviously the first pick isn't on Ewers that the receiver needs to cross the DB's face. Uh, but <laughs> you know, I mean, it was. I'm having a hard time even seven hours later understanding what I just watched. I went Ooh. back and watched a little more, and I was like, man, this is this is a really interesting result. And you had the the, the fake punt, the block punt. The crazy, crazy turnovers, the the, the red zone stops. I, I'd love to see him line it up and play again tomorrow. Like that was a great watch. I, I think Oklahoma showed that like they're not like they're not clearly inferior to Texas at all, right? Are they oh, clearly right. better in Texas? No, not really, but like they look pretty equal to me. And the game game came down to the final play. Like that's I'm excited to go watch the Big 12 title game. So can I can I just quickly throw this back? Isn't that what you should expect from this game? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like, yeah, oh, I mean, that was weird. That first quarter took an hour and 15 minutes. Right. You know, like, I just... And if we thought Texas would blow them out, I think we would have put them in lock. Turnovers. Yeah, like, like I, I feel like the Red River rivalry history is filled with these games that my in-laws are talking about because, <laughs> you know, they watch seven full college football games a year, but it's always going to end up being one of them. And part of it is because of the way it plays out. Like... I, I don't want to discredit the Oklahoma win or like not take enough into the Texas loss, but I think that part of our preview that we did all throughout the week included this game is nuts. Nuts. Yeah. Every single and it year. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's deep fried, it's big techs. It is gonna be one of those things that you cannot throw in the model. Like the model will not spit out the proper result for this game at any time, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, well, that's I, I, kind of a test of both of these programs. Like that's what Oklahoma and Texas should build into the good seasons for Oklahoma, the good seasons for Texas. They include most of the time strong performances here. So it's a measuring stick. And in that sense, great for the Sooners and uh, an interesting note for the Longhorns to see how they respond to this. I, I thought Oklahoma's defense played with great confidence and speed, by the way, like yeah. they, they weren't always effective. I mean, they gave up 500 and, what 40 yards mm -hmm. uh, like if they play that game tomorrow am i picking texas again yeah like i didn't have texas covering but like i yes i i think i would but still i thought like oklahoma was really confident in their plan and they played hair on fire which i think is all brent venables could really ask and they created enough chaos and on this saturday they got the turnovers that they needed to get to really swing that football game like that was that was impressive to me like they have learned his system pretty damn well and i, I I was impressed. Yeah, they were they were much more disruptive defensively than Texas was. They had yeah. the five sacks, ten tackles for loss, and that played a role in forcing those turnovers. And I mean, it's just yeah, like there's no takeaway from like there's been we'll get to it, but there's a lot of teams who lost today that you're kind of just writing off because you're like, okay, mm. they were exposed. I don't think anybody was exposed in this game. I think that these are both the two best teams in the Big 12, and I think that they both have a shot to win the league, and they both have a shot still to get to the playoffs. So it was just a crazy, very fun game. And another takeaway for me that kind of different, or at least not relevant to the future for the season, but it is, I fell in love with Jonathan Brooks today. There are a lot of good running backs in this country. And there are a lot of really good running backs in this sport who do a wonderful job running into giant holes when they open up. The difference between the really, really good ones and just the good ones are when there's not really a hole there and the guy can find a little crease and get through real quickly and get to the second level. Jonathan Brooks, if there's just even a little sliver of light between his guard and his tackle or his guard and his center, he gets through it really quick before the defense can react to it. And then the next thing you know, he's kind of one on one with a linebacker and he just makes one cut and he goes. It's like that is a very, very unique talent that just not a guy's not a lot of guys have. It's a vision and a decisiveness that just bodes really well for him. I um can I tell um a little bit of a hot mic moment? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Danny, who will join us, obviously, on Monday, it was mentioned. Did you mention it, Tom, the Jonathan Brooks for Heisman? No. It, so we were on for the 3 p.m. pregame show for uh, Alabama, Texas A&M, and everybody's sort of getting set. The uh, Red River game's going nuts. And somebody mentioned something like, oh, like Jonathan Brooks. And Danny says, Jonathan Brooks for Heisman if they win. 
which like I loved as a way to reframe the way looking at Texas. Obviously, Texas lost the game. The Jonathan Brooks for Heisman is not, you know, the same sort of doesn't have the same engine behind it as it does if they had won. But Jonathan Brooks is probably the best and most important player on this Texas offense. And that is Mm -hmm. not at all what I expected coming into the season. And it's crazy because, I mean, he's not B. John Robinson. Let's, Let's get that clear right off the bat. But this is a Texas team that off of last year's team lost two running backs in Bijan and then Roshan Johnson, who was a fourth round pick to the NFL. And then they just roll out Jonathan Brooks and he's just as, you know, he's playing spectacularly too. And he's taken, you know, a load off of Quinn Ewers, making life a lot easier for them in every single facet because he is an excellent running back, but he's also useful as a weapon out of the backfield in the passing game. Anything else on uh, the game that stood out? I mean, we mentioned wanting to see round two uh, because Texas is the one that, which lost. I I think we have a, a pretty good chance that we will get round two, right? If Oklahoma had lost, I it, it sort of depends. Uh, but in Texas, and you're has, sweating Provo in November, like, oh, yeah, are they going right. to go and blow it? Which I hey, mean, sounds unlikely, but I mean, ask Fresno State. About going to that mountain time zone and playing in the mountains. It, it, it is difficult at times. Texas goes at Houston, first of all, bye week. At Houston, host BYU, host Kansas State, who they routed last year. At TCU, which appears to be broken uh, right now. At mm-hmm. Iowa State, and then host Texas Tech. I mean, they will be pretty substantially favored in, in all of those football games. Uh, so a, a, a rematch does seem pretty likely. Uh, now, will they be eleven and one versus twelve and zero rematch? I don't know. We'll have to see. But I, the Big Twelve is very likely to be a one bid league only because of some of the stuff going on in the league right now. It looks like with, with some of these losses. So that's going to be a really that like might be the most important conference championship game. Also, another thing to keep an eye on, too, Jake Majors, you know, Texas's starting center got hurt early in this game, didn't come back. His status going forward will probably be pretty important because he's a big part of their line. Yeah. I I do think that where Brent has that Oklahoma defensive line, it's probably one of the better defensive fronts in the conference. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I... I, I but just, that's that's saying as much about the rest of the conference as it is Oklahoma, though. Sure, sure. I, I I was just trying to like give some Texas, like, okay, you lost maybe your second most important offensive lineman, if not maybe your first, and now, you know, what do you have moving forward? I just don't think you're going to face a group quite like what Oklahoma has. Here's. Here's a rhetorical question for you guys, based on what I'm staring at on my TV in front of me, where Arizona is currently up 17 to seven on USC. Oh, hell yeah. We remember how it's Oklahoma fans stuff. were last year, correct? Tebow and all that. Yeah. What happens if Oklahoma gets to the playoff before Lincoln does with USC? Uh, Just oh, what is, man. what is, what is, how is that fan base going to be? Do you think they'll like start celebrating their own team as opposed to just trying to dunk on USC? <laughs> I mean, I, I think they'll have all 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 the tweet you know, like the bandwidth to do both. The, Twitter blue is going to just go absolutely nuts because all Oklahoma fans are, are going to sign up with they want they're not going to be rate limited. They're like, no man, I got to get all these tweets off about my team and also about all the smack I need to talk about Oklahoma or about USC. Let's go. <laughs> it's just it's a funny hypothetical to think about because. I mean, possible. considering how everything looked at this time last year with Sooners finishing six and seven and everybody, you know, Caleb Williams winning the Heisman. And now the way things are, I mean, obviously USC still has plenty of time to come back and win this game. It's just, it's, there's been a vibe shift in that rivalry. <laughs> the Oklahoma USC rivalry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, the, the Oklahoma Lincoln Riley rivalry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, like TBD on what happens the rest of the night because we are still dealing with Caleb Williams. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to count any of that out. 